All right, guys, so I'm here with Dick Brickner, who is the president of the Columbia, Tennessee Area Beekeepers Association. All right. And you've been beekeeping for how many years now? I got back into it in 2007, so it's uh, going on 15 years. Okay. Yeah. And I want to, uh, Dick is a wealth of information, but today I want to pick his brain about one very specific thing, and that is your spring management method. Okay. You, you are using a checkerboarding technique. Yes. To expand the brood nest, and you're not doing splits, you're not... Uh, you're not equalizing brood between hives and no and all that you're just checkerboarding expanding the brood nest and keeping empty comb on top of the colonies correct and the point of that is to create really big populations and but it a side benefit mm -hmm. is you can also keep your number of hives pretty stable by doing that yes i uh, i had 29 hives at one time and didn't produce a lot of honey and it had a lot of work, so uh, when I first heard about checkerboarding and started to explore it, it made a lot of sense. It worked, and uh, I'm down to uh, about 14 hives now, and 12 is even sounding better because <laughs> checkerboarding is a lot of work, but it pays off. Yeah. Yes. So let's talk about the results from this. What have you averaged in honey production per hive the last few years? Uh, two years ago was excellent. I had about 161 pounds per hive. Uh, the following year we had a pretty bad spring and I think we were down around 110 pounds, but uh, this past year back up to about 135 pounds a hive. Yeah. yeah. So two years ago we had a fairly poor spring flow and a really good fall flow. This past year, we had a pretty good spring flow and a really bad fall flow. Very bad fall flow, yeah. yeah. And to put this in context, in our area of Tennessee, I think the state average is around 50 pounds per hive uh, surplus. Mike Studer publishes a number at the uh, TBA conference every spring, and it uh, it's around 58 to 60. Okay, 58 to 60. How he calculates 60. that, I don't know, but <laughs> uh, I've got to agree that's probably about right. Okay, so you're you're doubling that mm. and in some years close to tripling it yes with this method yes so you you are like me um you keep in all mediums <clears throat> yes and uh we i arrived at this separate from you i didn't know that you were doing this when i got into mm. beekeeping makes a lot of sense to me um i'll probably do a video on that at some point because there are some advantages and some disadvantages to it but for checkerboarding especially it makes life a lot easier because all of your combs are interchangeable totally uh, you don't have to worry about having two different size combs or Correct. two different size boxes or anything you can take comb from a honey super and mm. put it in the brood area if you need to um, totally so. interchangeable and uh, when i was at the 29 hive level using deeps mediums and shallows Ooh. the inventory was horrendous yeah yeah so everything back here now can go on any hive at any time yes so when you what do you go to winter in is it two mediums or three mediums two and three mediums two or three mediums yes, at okay the most yeah at the most and stone you, colonies get three mediums mi yeah. mid-sized you pull them back if they're in three and just condense them to two y yes i will do that okay yeah. so let's say that we have got a triple medium hive here and i've got black plastic frames in the bottom i've got wood frames in the top three boxes these two are going to be foundation only but i did bring one box of drawn comb of yes. drawn comb mm -hmm. which is important um, for checkerboarding to work you've pretty much got to have drawn comb would you agree with that uh, that helps <laughs> uh, but you are able to introduce a couple of new frames uh, for them to draw yeah. during that main nectar flow, and they can draw it fast. So you can so, generate new frames every year to replace uh, some of the old stuff you've got to call out. The, the timing on these maneuvers is very important because yes. the, the point of this is to slow down the swarm impulse until after they get into the main nectar flow and right. once the main nectar flow starts they the bees just think oh goodness let's go let's go get this um, so if you can get them into the main nectar flow without them swarming 
then there's a good chance that this is going to work. Right. And they may still swarm later in the season. You know, I think that you typically have, you know, June swarms. Yes. Um, but our honey crop is made at that point. Right. And most of the swarms I'll see uh, from mid-June through August are uh, replacing the queen. They're not truly division swarms that uh, because the hive is too crowded. At that point, okay. that's when most so, of my so they, queens get replaced. So in, in other words, they were trying to supersede, but yes. they made three or four virgins instead of just one, and one of the virgins got out and took some bees with her. Yeah. Okay. So at what time of year do you typically do this? Or at what time in the pollen flow, or, or what keys are you looking for to tell you when to do this maneuver? Uh, start looking at the brood population. I uh, inspected all of my hives December 30th, and they all had at least one frame in the center uh, with a good population of brood on it. But uh, again, I looked at them yesterday, and uh, the weather yes. we've had has really uh, knocked the population back. So the queen has not been producing a lot of brood the last couple of weeks and uh, yeah so we're at the tail end of January early February now yes and, uh, and it, they'll start it, picking up with the warmer weather we're yeah. starting to see too it was actually really warm in November and December and then we got hammered with cold in January, in January so yeah. yep. okay so when do you look for pollen coming in do you look for increased brood production um, is it a time of year thing? When, when do you typically go in and checkerboard? I, I think I prefer to see that pollen and our silver maple trees around here are our first good pollen producer. Mm -hmm. And I've got Ultra B out there on the pollen stand there now and the bees are hitting it pretty heavy but as soon as there's a good supply of natural pollen they will not touch that Ultra B anymore. Yeah. And that's a good time then that I feel I can look at the hive and if everything looks good inside the hive, I'll do the reversal. That's generally been from mid-February through the first week of March. There's not a fixed date you can look at that. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so good pollen source comes in. Uh, you've got dry pollen out and they're they're on the Ultra B. I've got Ultra B out too and they're swarming it on these warm days. Yes. So when that stops, it's usually because of pollen flow has started. Yes. And if you go and look at the maples, if you look at the elms, um, you will start to see some of that. Right. American hazelnuts real early as well. Sometimes you'll see bees on that. Um, so what what is your first maneuver? You said a, a reversal. So you're doing a box reversal, obviously. Yes. Yeah, so at this time of the year, you'll probably find the, the bottom box totally empty. Yeah. They've eaten all of the stores in there and have moved up. And the brood is generally always in the top box unless it's a super population and then they'll also be in the middle box. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so I'll probably begin by just setting the top two boxes aside, pull the bottom box out. <coughs> and then take that top box with the bulk of the brood and put it on the bottom. Okay. And if there is brood on a couple of frames in that box, depending on how many brood frames I have in the bottom, if there's only three or four, you'll and condense, maybe a couple you'll there, the brood. I'll put them all together. So you get all the brood into one box if you can. If I can. Okay. If, if I can't, I will not have more than five frames because I, I do nine frame spacing on okay. my boxes. And I always see those outside two frames for pollen and honey, and honey. nectar. Okay. Yeah. So if there's more than five frames of brood, definitely leave those in the middle on that box and put it back on the hive. So we're going to get this box back on here. So they've got probably some food, some open space, maybe a little bit of brood in here. Right. I'll pull the those brood is in the frames bottom. in adjacent to the brood. The rest of the frames on the outside are empty. And uh, I'll start right there. I don't necessarily put that third box on right okay. now. It may be a, another week, two weeks, or three weeks. <coughs> it's when I can start to see bees covering all the frames. Put that next box on. So do you, do you bring your brood box back and 
checkerboard with that since this is empty comb now? Yes. Okay. Yep. So you're doing a checkerboard maneuver out of twos even though we went into winter in three. Right. Okay. So the next step is going to be the checkerboarding. No, not yet. Not yet. <laughs> you always get to three boxes before you start checkerboarding. Okay. Because the third box goes on. Again, you wait until you start to see bees on most of those frames. And you're going to give this back to them. Put the queen excluder on. I started using queen excluders. Again, I didn't for years, but I think it's worthwhile to do it. Are you putting the queen excluder on after two or after three? Three. So we're going to put right. this back. The bees are now, it's been two weeks since we did the reversal and right. the reduction. A lot, a lot of bees in here now. A lot of bees. Good brood. Good brood pattern. We're going to give them that third box back. We'll let them go to work on that. Let them go to work on that. And you coming back another two weeks or? I would say I'd start looking at my hives every week uh, starting really uh, about the first of April. Okay. Because I'll just pop a top just to count frames and see what the population's doing. Okay. And then as soon as that's getting full enough, put a queen excluder on. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> and add uh, and add add a, a super. Yeah. A super of drawn comb. Right. Yeah, I would always go off drawn comb. Now this isn't truly the start of the checkerboarding yet because the theory in checkerboarding is they they will fill a box overhead over their brood nest mm -hmm. and at that point that pretty well convinces them that they have enough stores and enough bees and their natural thing to do is to split the queen out and start a new hive and swarm okay so we keep coming back on a weekly basis we look and as soon as we start to see good honey filling these boxes this top box <coughs> Now we'll take every other frame out of this box, one, three, five, seven, and nine, and put it in an empty box. And checkerboard in empty comb here. Yes. And then the frames that I had to take out of this box to put the honey frames into go back into here. So now I have in this box full frame, empty, full frame, just checkerboard across. And then the box that goes on top has just the opposite pattern. I'll have a full frame okay. over an empty frame. I'm, I'm going <coughs> to take a couple of these boxes of black frames or one box of the black frames and actually do this checkerboarding maneuver because that'll be a good visual, I think. Yeah. So let's take a second and do that. Okay. Okay. All right. So, <coughs> so the camera can see this. That's our orientation here. Right. These would have had some nectar in them or maybe even some honey by then and these would be open comb right drawn comb that is empty and this box is the opposite of this one so you've got an empty comb with a full comb on top of it right and a full comb with an empty comb on top of it right okay now the bees will in this main nectar flow come in and attack this top box first and fill it okay so again you're going to come back and when you find <laughs> this box filling up with honey you'll be ready to add a third box <coughs> now you only do checkerboarding in two two of the boxes and that's the two immediately above the brood section so this one's heavy <coughs> you're going to set it off it's full of honey, almost. Maybe those outside frames are half filled. Mm -hmm. And uh, you're just going to take an empty super and you, under super it? You have a lot of honey in this thing here, in this box. So now you need to take this box and an empty and checkerboard again. Okay. All right. So we're going to checkerboard this box and this box right again yes we're going to keep two checkerboarded mediums above the brood nest at all times, all times. 
at all times. Right. So how often are you doing these maneuvers? April and May, uh, I'll end up with a high of seven or eight boxes high. So it's... So you're adding a box every time you check your board? Almost every 10 days at, at the most, yeah. Okay. Yeah, when that flow is really coming in, it's, it's hitting you pretty fast, yeah. Yeah. So you get um, 10, 15, 20, 30 hives and you're doing this every 10 days, that gets to be quite a bit of work. A lot of work. <laughs> a lot of work. Yes, it but is. But you're also <laughs> doubling or tripling the honey production. Right. Okay. Yeah. So let's pretend that we've checkerboarded this. Okay. You're you're basically under supering it at right. this point. Put this one back. Back on top. And then we're gonna come back in a week, a week or days. ten days and do the same thing again. Again. At that point though, at we would at this point we've got two full boxes. Got two full boxes, so we're gonna strip both of those off. Right. Bring it down to there. And I wish they were that light. Yeah. <laughs> All right, and then again, with an empty, we're gonna checkerboard these two, put it back together, put those back on top. Yep. And somewhere around the first of June, when you get up there about seven boxes high, you're gonna find those top three boxes uh, have enough frames you can, you can pull honey. Yeah. Yeah. So how high do you let your hives go? I've had them 11 boxes high. That is uh, pretty hard to work. But yeah. Uh, using a two ladder system, I, uh, I can get up here, uh, also some tables that sit on the side here. I can disassemble a box, because I will not try to lift that medium full of honey. I'll take uh, maybe five of the frames out and set them down in an empty box, and then it's half weight. I can handle that easier. And uh, I'll disassemble it and bring it down. It may take an hour to do a whole hive. Mm -hmm. yeah. So do you have, you've got strong hives and weak hives. Yeah, you'll have do, some weak do you hives. Ever, do you ever pull <clears throat> boxes off of your taller hives and set them on weaker hives, I just so it's not so tall to work? I started that last year. When I got to that eighth box, yeah. I pulled that box and put it on a weaker hive. Yeah. Yeah, because the seven was, I felt very comfortable working with the seven hive stack, yeah. And this keeps going until honey's ready to harvest. <clears throat> Generally around uh, June 1st, you'll take your first boxes off of the hives. And I'll probably pull again about uh, July 15th and uh, about August 30th. And I'll do a final pull uh, end of September then. Okay. Yeah. So we've got our major flow is going to be May some in June, and then depending on whether we get any basswood or not, you can have a little bit in early July. Yes. Um, white clover here is not really predictable or, no, it isn't. or consistent in any way. No. So after July, we go into a dearth, and um, if we get a fall flow, that's going to be asters and goldenrod. It right. really gets started in September. Uh, can go through October. So you're actually picking up some honey even through the dearth. Yes. Well, it'll what, surprise you, but you do. You're, In this area, you do. Yeah. Yeah. That, that is surprising. Mm -hmm. And the population dynamics that create a big honey crop is interesting because there's a certain percentage of bees in the hive that have got to tend to the hive. They've got to stay indoors and tend right. to brood and do housekeeping and guard duty and t watch after the queen and cure nectar and, and this and that. So as you put more and more and more bees inside the hive, not only can more bees go out and be foragers, but a higher percentage of bees can go out and be foragers. Correct. Yes. So if you if you double the number of bees in a hive, honey production does not double. Honey production goes up by two and a half to three times. Mm -hmm. And this maneuver is taking advantage of that. You keep the bees home, keep them working. You've got a ton of bees. Right. And you're actually gaining a little bit of weight even, even during the dearth. Yes. And you've actually got the data on that because you've got a hive on scales with Broodminder. I've, I've got Broodminder on two hives right now, and I just purchased two more units to uh, 
<laughs> look at all three of my apiaries, yeah. Yep. Interesting statistics, yes. Interesting mm -hmm. stuff. Well, Dick, I really appreciate you showing me this. Is there anything else that you would like to talk about? Well. Ma magical secrets that make this all work? <laughs> like I said, this is a lot of work. It's, it's uh, something you've got to want to do, but it pays off. Yeah. Yeah. And there's a reason that you don't see a lot of commercial scaled beekeepers doing this. It's because it's so much labor. Labor intensive. Yeah. And you're, you are trying to give up uh, producing new colonies in order to produce honey. Yes. And honey's not <clears throat> consistent year to year, whereas producing new colonies can be pretty consistent year yes, to year. Yes, you can, yeah. So if you're diversifying income as a commercial beekeeper, it makes sense to make nukes in the spring and sell them and then make some honey as well. Yes. Um, but for the backyard beekeeper that doesn't want to have a lot more hives, doesn't want to split and equalize and, and make increase, this is a, a good way to have pretty stable hive numbers, but also make a lot of honey. Right. I will make some splits uh, starting in mid-June just to have some resource hives because some of the hives will not replace the queen until yeah. October, November, and the drone supply then is pretty poor and uh, they don't do a good job of getting well-mated queens. So I try to have at least four resource hives on the side to replace failed queens. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's pretty important. Uh, new beekeepers especially may not know this, but you're going to have attrition every year. Yes. And if you don't have attrition one year, that's an outlier. Yeah, that is an outlier. Um, so that, that's just something that you have to deal with. All right, Dick, I really okay. appreciate it. Glad you made it down here. Yeah, I'm, I'm thrilled with I've got some this. weather to do it in too. Yeah, it's nice today, 62, really nice.